This is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Hill Country Podcast. In today's episode, we visit with author Lauren Steffi about his first work of fiction, The Big Empty. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I am thrilled to have back with me Lauren Steffi. Lauren is a multifaceted professional with lots of talents. And today we're going to explore his novelist gene because we're going to talk about his novel, The Big Empty. So, Lauren, first of all, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Lauren, I've talked to you over the years on some of your business columns. I've talked to you about your reflections on the in-run trial. I've talked to you about uh, some of the nonfiction books you've written. But uh, then you came up and wrote a a work of fiction. And when I sat down and read it, it was one of the most uh, enjoyable books I've read in a long time. So maybe I could start with uh, what led you to write a work of fiction uh, after all these years? You know, this book actually started uh, back in the 1990s. I I always kind of thought at some point in my life I was going to write a novel. And um, really kind of what drew me to writing, even back when I was like eight years old, I, I kind of thought fiction would be where I wound up. Um, I kind of got it sidetracked by journalism because uh, what I found in journalism was it, it combined two things that I was interested in. One was figuring out how things work and why they work the way they do, and then the other is writing. Um, but at, at one point, I kind of um, you know decided to dabble in fiction, and I started this book, and then I kind of set it aside, came back to it. And, and you know, like a lot of journalists, I mean – Nonfiction was kind of what I did, and um, so it, it seemed kind of, um, you know, a, a detour, if you will, and so it was just not a, a huge priority, but um, when the pandemic hit, um, I had a lot of time to think about things, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the book was mostly done by that point, and I let some other people read it, and my, my wife had been encouraging me to publish it for years and years, and um, so I finally decided it was time to go ahead and do it, take the plunge. <laughs> so Lauren, I typically tend to uh, read mysteries and thrillers and science fiction in the fiction realm, um, not novels that are character driven. And I found this to be character driven with some of the best character descriptions I've read. Part of it was because I knew most of these people. Uh, probably part of it is uh, we're both Texans, so uh, we tend to know the same ki- types of stereotypes and same types of characters. But I was wondering if you could just maybe tell us how you were able to take such, not just a deep dive, uh, but it, it was more than just omniscient third party looking at somebody. It was them inside their souls. You know, that was really something that kind of evolved over time. I mean, um, and I think that, that part of the benefit of, of sort of this process of writing a little bit on it and then, then letting it sit for a while and coming back to it probably kind of enhanced that that process. I didn't really set out to write a ca- character-driven novel either. I I was interested with this idea of the sense of place, um, you know, that, that certain places have a have a strong sense to them. Like when you're there, you know you're there sort of thing. And, and how that evolves, what draws people to it, and what happens when it's threatened, right? And that was kind of, those were sort of the themes I went into it working on. But um, in, in hindsight, I don't think you could actually write that book without, you know, having these strong characters to kind of pull you through that journey. And so I think it was sort of inevitable, but um, it's also kind of a process of, you know, writing a, a chapter and then realizing like, well, wait, why would they actually do that? And, you know, it, does this really make sense? And and the more you get to know the characters, the more they kind of show you uh, when you're not writing them well. You know, when you're when you're not giving enough insight into their motivation or whatever. And so, it kind of became this evolutionary process where I just sort of realized, like, um, and for example, the the Blaine Witherspoon character uh, was one that was pretty one dimensional when I first wrote it, and I kept coming back because it bothered me that you know. He was, ex- you know, he was doing things without any real reason for doing them, and, and it was because I needed things to happen in the plot. But of course, that's not the reason things would happen really in the story. And so, I, I really spent a lot of time trying to get inside his head. So I interviewed a, uh, a historical fiction author earlier this week, and uh, sh- one of her characters. It was uh, around the California Gold Rush, and a very strong woman, and she goes to California and falls in love and get married. And I asked her, I said. 
did you intend for her to do that? Or did she just do it on her own? And she said, she just did it on her own. Did you have any characters who really stepped out and did things that surprised you in your writing process? Um, I, no, I, I don't know that it, that it surprised me. I think what surprised me as a writer was um, how people react to the characters when they read the book. I mean, you know, having written a lot of nonfiction, you know, you're writing about obviously real people, in many cases famous people, and, and uh, you know, your readers sort of bring their own opinions to what you write. But with fiction, you're introducing them to a character, and uh, the way they connect, it... it, it it's just a very different experience, and, and a great example of that was I, I did an excerpt from the book, and um, the start of Chapter 2, it opens with a fist fight, and, and Trace Malloy, who's the main character, uh, punches Blaine Witherspoon, who's the other main character, in the nose. And I kind of ended that excerpt at, at the point where that, that scene is over and Blaine's driving, I mean, uh, Malloy's driving off. And when my wife saw it on my blog, she got really upset. She said, that just makes Trace look so bad. And you didn't explain why he was doing that. There was a real reason. You know, Witherspoon had that coming. And, and you know, <laughs> and I said, you know, you realize these aren't real people. <laughs> but, you know, she had, because she had read the book so many times over the years, she really did identify with the characters. And it bothered her that I was, you know, she felt like I, there, there was more that needed to be explained and, and that I wasn't being fair to, to one of my characters. And I, I think that's really the thing that I found very different about doing fiction was the fact that, that the characters become kind of these real people. And yeah, they do things and they, they show you where they want to go. And it's uh, it's a weird, weird thing. And I, I've heard writers talk about that before, and, but until I did this, I didn't appreciate it. Well, maybe we ought to step back and have you tell us the, uh, the story arc so our listeners will understand how these crazy characters fit into it. <laughs> So uh, the, the Big Empty takes its name from, uh, you know, the region of West Texas where there's, you know, quite simply not a lot there. And uh, it's set in a, uh, in a small ranching town um, that uh, is kind of uh, surrounded by, uh, you know, one of the grand old Texas ranches. And as many towns in that part of the world, it has uh, declined in population over the years. And um, the, the locals have been trying to figure out ways to revive the town, ways to keep it alive. Uh, and so there's an opportunity for a semiconductor manufacturing plant to come to town and set up a big plant there. And uh, the book is really about the, the culture clash that ensues once that starts to happen. And you have people moving in uh, from California, from other parts of the country, who don't really understand the way of life in that part of the world and why things are done a certain way. And, um, you know, and so the locals are really kind of struggling with this idea of if you want to have a future, how much of your past do you have to give up in order to make that happen? One of the things uh, that intrigued me was the repetitions and the cycles of history within the ranching industry. And it seemed like the same cycles that started when uh, – People first started to ranch along the big empty or the, what became the conquistador um, continued literally up uh, to the time of the novel. And around the time I was reading your book, there was a reposting of a famous Texas monthly piece by one of your predecessors uh, who traveled to Marfa in 1975 and wrote a piece on Marfa. And it was just when artists were starting to find Marfa. And he, he talked about some of the themes you talked about, but the other, the part that really struck me was the cycles of ranching. So I uh, was wondering if you could maybe talk about why why no sane person might go into ranching, <laughs> yet when people go into it, uh, they love it. And that part of the, the story, I almost found it to be a love story with the land. Yeah, it, it is kind of a love story with the land, and, and, and that was part of what I wanted to capture with this idea of the sense of place, was that you can have this place that seems barren and inhospitable to most outsiders, but if you're from there, it's home, right, and you feel connected to it. And the main character, Trace Withers, or I'm sorry, uh, Trace Malloy, uh, tries to, you know, uh, when he's a young man, he tries to leave, and he can't leave. He's, he, he comes back. He's going to go off join the merchant marine and see the world. And he only gets as far as Kansas uh, because he, he just can't leave the place behind. And so, um, you know, that that's very much uh, a, a part of, of the story. And, and, you know, the idea of, as you, t as you say, the ranching cycles, 
at some point during my research, somebody in the in the cattle business made the point that you know we we glorify cowboys and the old west and all this stuff, and it's such a part of American history. And yet, if you look at it, there were really only about fifteen or so fifteen or so good years for the ranching industry, and that was you know in the in in the nineteenth century, uh, you know, and and yet it because people are drawn to it and it has this sort of mythical place. Um, it endures, and I think it's one of those jobs, not unlike journalism, where a lot of people are drawn to it and love it, even though it's a real struggle, and it may not be economically rewarding, but there's there's other things you get out of it, and I think for for a certain type of person, um, it's still a very very appealing business despite the, despite the hardship. It's it's interesting you say that because I had the same not observation but feeling reading the book. And I thought about you as a journalist, and I thought about, you know, ranching is more than a profession. It's a love. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, and I call myself a lawyer and proudly do so, but it's a profession to me, and it's my professional life. And, and I thought about you and the kind of the your story as you've related to me a few times over the years uh, as a journalist, and, and I really see you as, I see journalism for you as much more than a profession, or, or at least you did. Now you're off to, to do some other things, but it, it seems to me there's a real love there around what you did and what journalists continue to do today. The way I read about the cowboys and the ranch hands uh, in this book. Yeah. I, I don't know that that was a, a conscious thing on my part to, to kind of relate the two, but it is a, a sort of similar journey. And, um, you know, and I think it's it's one that that Malloy wrestles with throughout the book, right? He he knows it's a tough business. He knows there's an easier way to make a living. Uh, his own brother, right, left and and went and started a successful business in Dallas, and and you know, and he kind of resents him for it. Um, and, and so it it really was, you know. That, that idea that you're drawn to this thing, which, you know, this job that may not love you back uh, in some ways, um, you know, that was, a, that was a big part of, the, of what I was trying to capture there. That, that you know, there's a reason, I, I guess, I guess what, what always bothered me, you know, I grew up in a small town. I was originally born in Pennsylvania, grew up in a small town there. And I remember uh, when, a, when a big distribution center came to town and, and we started to have people from New York and big cities coming, they were very dismissive of the town. You know, oh, you're, it's a small town. You know, you're just a bunch of hicks or whatever. And it was like, no, you know, like you don't understand the history here. You haven't been a part of it. You don't, you don't understand why things are the way they are. And um, I think that's something that always stuck with me because um, I was pretty young when, when I remember my dad talking about that. And uh, it was something that definitely found its way into the themes of this book that, you know, people don't just live out in the middle of nowhere because they don't know what they're doing, right? I mean, they've found a way to make a living in a place where, quite frankly, most of us probably couldn't. And so there are lessons to be learned there, and it shouldn't just be dismissed because you want to come in and build a subdivision and put in, you know, well-manicured lawns or whatever. <laughs> uh, let's turn to Lance Witherspoon because he, he was a fascinating character. He is the... Uh, Blaine, Blaine Witherspoon. Blaine, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I was going to call him the uh, antagonist, but you've called him the co-star. <laughs> uh, but Blaine uh, was very much a corporate animal. Uh, he uh, does well in the corporate world. He plays that game well, but he fancies himself a problem solver. And when he moves to the big empty, he's got a host of problems that he's never had to face. Do the skills he learned in the corporate world, even as a problem solver in the corporate world, translate? Or are they so different that he can't overcome them? Yeah, that was actually one of the things I really enjoyed about writing his character. I don't think they translate at all. He found himself, he did, he fancied himself a problem solver. He knew how to navigate the corporate world, the tech world. You know, he had moved from, you know, all these different towns, but always with the, within this sort of tech bubble or tech, you know, atmosphere. When he finds himself completely outside of that, cut off from everything he knows, he really doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to solve problems. He doesn't understand why, you know, somebody can punch him in the nose and it doesn't result in criminal charges or a lawsuit or whatever. Um, you know, he, he, he really um, is completely a fish out of water. And, and that was, you know, one of the things I found fascinating about him was, you know, how was he going to deal with that? And how was that going to, wh where was that going to lead him uh, on his journey within the book? 
There are uh, several other themes in the book, uh, as well as uh, the ones we've talked about. Uh, economics is one, water is one, power is one. But I wanted to maybe start with the subdivision and the <laughs> subdivision of the tech executives. And um, I don't know if that stood for uh, Adam and Eve having to leave the Garden of Eden <laughs> or... Uh, wow. <laughs> but that seemed to be the biggest symbol of the newcomers who didn't understand. Can you explain really that, that symbol and what was it they didn't understand that caused them to try to build that? Well, what they didn't understand was the land itself, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the land is really a character in the book in a lot of ways. And, and the subdivision represents this incredibly stark contrast between uh, the new and the old, right? They're they're coming in. They're building a traditional suburb in, in this you know area where where water, for example, is critical. And they want to put in a little you know a little decorative pond, and they want a um, you know a golf course, and they want all these things that take water for entertainment values. And they don't really understand how critical it is, um, you know, for human survival. And, and so um, th- everything about that subdivision is sort of a contrast with everything that's around it and to me the the you know where that's kind of epitomized is the gate right when when trace malloy goes there and it's he's it's an electric gate and he's used to getting out and opening his gates by hand and there's one scene where he pulls up and he starts to get out of the truck and then the gate opens and he's like oh yeah he kind of rolls his eyes and gets back in the car and drives on um so it really represented you know, everything new, everything that was different, uh, you know, coming coming into this environment. Uh, one of the themes I mentioned uh, was water. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, uh, the, the subdivision was a part of the water discussion, but the plant was a part of the water discussion. Could you describe what the plant was going to manufacture, or why they needed such massive amounts of water and how that seemed to be almost in direct contrast or conflict rather with the ranching that was going on. Yeah. So water is obviously a big deal as it is in in most parts of Texas. Um, And, and, you know, it's something that again, Texas, the water situation is a little different. We have, uh, you know, in most of the state, we rely on groundwater, which is not something people in other parts of the country are necessarily familiar with. So if you move in and you think, oh, I'm buying a house and, you know, oh, there's this nice subdivision and you don't realize that, you know, maybe the developer didn't didn't spend enough time, you know, drilling the well deep enough or whatever. You know, there, there's a lot of things people take for granted about water. And um, so I wanted to try to capture that. And, and part of the reason I chose a, a, a semiconductor plant was that it, it seems to be this clean, new, high-tech industry that offers all this promise. But you actually use a tremendous amount of water in producing semiconductors because you literally wash the circuit boards or wash the, um, the wafers when you build them. And so uh, the amount of water that's required is significant. And in a place like that, um, it really found itself in conflict with things like the ranch where they need the water to, to literally keep their, keep their product alive, if you will, right? Um, not to mention the townspeople themselves that in the past, you know, when there have been droughts, they may have gone without water or, or, or cut down on their own personal use of water so that the ranch could have water uh, to keep the cows alive. And so, a- again, that's a notion that's just so foreign to the people coming in from outside who are used to all the modern conveniences and just don't really think about that. The other issue around the plant was power. And uh, that's something you have written about from the business perspective for, I don't know how long, 15 years, maybe, maybe longer. But the issue of power in Texas still bedevils us literally to this day. Uh, I think people understand a semiconductor plant is going to take massive amounts of power. But how did that, I don't want to say disfigure the land, but at least disrupt it in the book? Yeah, and let me just offer a disclaimer for, for readers that I did not go into a detailed discussion of the, the electricity markets uh, in this book. I spared, I spared our readers that. So, um, and, but, it, but it is something that I've written about for a long time, and, and what, what really comes into play in the book is because the plant needs so much power, um, we get into this issue of building transmission and how do you get power to the plant. And, you know, the part of the discussion is, okay, 
you know, the most direct route for building this power line, it cuts right across uh, the Conquistador Ranch, which is the, the big ranch of the book. And so they have to decide if they're going to be willing to allow that and, and that sort of thing. And, of course, um, uh, ultimately it, it provides for, you know, the, the basis for the, the, the final scene, the climax of the, of the whole book. So The... Um and then one thing I did want to ask you about near the as we get towards the end, there was a chapter when I read it. It almost slapped me in the face. I found it so different than the rest of the book, and it was a chapter about accounting fraud. And <laughs> any listeners to podcast I've done with you will know exactly why we we're talking about accounting fraud. But when I read that, I thought this seems completely out of place. And then it ended. But upon reflection, I thought, you know, maybe that's a way to explain uh, Witherspoon because we had this chapter that seemed completely out of place, and in less than a snap of a finger, he knew what to do because it was in the corporate world, and he was comfortable with that, and he recognized accounting fraud for what it was, but he, and he also recognized what he could do in response. So I wanted to ask you about that chapter. Was that... Uh, an homage to your uh, uh, covering the Enron trial, <laughs> gavel to gavel. Was it something else? Because literally, when I read that, it just literally slapped me in the face. It was so different than anything else in the book. You know, it's funny because that chapter came together again. Witherspoon was a character who evolved probably more than any of the others in the book, and and part of it was because I wanted to make him more human. And my um, my editor uh, on the book actually. Um, was reading it and she said, you know, we really kind of need to explain his sort of change of heart that occurs over, you know, over time in the book. And, um, and I, I started thinking a lot about like, what would it take to make him sort of change his mind on, on uh, everything he's doing there? And um, it really had to be something big. And so I started thinking about, you know, what would cause, you know, somebody to become very disillusioned with, you know, a big company. And it just sort of, you know, it, it didn't take much to, to realize that, that, you know, as you put it, an homage to, to the Enron uh, saga. Was, and, and the thing that I enjoyed about that was by, by sort of making this allusion to an Enron-type issue that came up, um, you know, this book actually takes place before Enron. So mm -hmm. at, at the time, you know, I, I actually have a line in there where he's like, nobody would do, like, no company would do that. And <laughs> so I, I, was having that. A I was having a little fun with it. But, um, but yeah, it really kind of did become, you know, I mean, yeah, he knew what to do. And yet in the end, it, it, it didn't make any difference. And that was kind of the other, the other theme was that, you know, if you look, I mean, everything that the company Aztec uh, Semiconductor does in the book, you know, they, don't, they aren't necessarily making the best decisions. And it, it's beyond Witherspoon himself. Um, you know, it's kind of one of these things where they're going to do what they're going to do. And, um, you know, and, and so he ultimately found that he could not, he, he couldn't, he figured out what was going on, but he couldn't do anything about it. So you said uh, you wrote this book on and off. It was published in 2021. Uh, the events uh, occurred sometime in the late 1990s. Uh, it, it seemed to me that if it didn't presage many of the issues we currently face in the state of Texas, it certainly mirrors what you've seen. Uh, by setting it that far back, were you kind of setting us up for a preview of, of economic issues, water rights, electricity, and a host of others for the 2020s. I, I would like to tell you that I had that much foresight that I could anticipate all of these things. <laughs> but, uh, but the reality was I, I said it at that time because that was when I started writing it. And, um, and again, my editor actually made the point. Um, she, she kept asking me, you know, as she was reading the book, she said, what year is this? What year is this? And I said, well, you know, late 90s, right? I mean, they're making 300 millimeter wafers. Like that was what they were doing back in the day, you know, kind of stuff like that. And she's like, no, no, but I want to know the exact year. And I said, well, I hadn't really, I don't know that I want to nail it down that much. And she's like, no, it's important because she said, if, if for example, it's 1999, like remember how optimistic we were about technology at the, at, you know, at the end of the last century, we thought technology was going to open up all these new opportunities. It was going to be 
It was going to make our lives so much easier and happier. It was going to solve all these problems. And, you know, we were on the cusp of this new millennium when everything was going to be different and better and wonderful. And she's like, don't you remember how, like, because well, she was my editor uh, at Bloomberg and, and we were cover we were on the technology team. And she's like, don't you remember how we looked at, at all this stuff? Like, the only downside was Y2K. And we thought if we got through that, <laughs> right, we were, we were great. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I kind of forgotten that stuff. And so I, I actually went back and put in some references to, you know, the fact that the new millennium was dawning and the, the hopes that that would bring and everything, because it really was a very different time. It was, you know, pre-9-11, uh, pre, you know, uh, Iraq war, pre, uh, you know, social media and, and surveillance technology and so, you know, iPhones and everything, right? And so it, it kind of our view of technology, I think, has changed a lot in in the 20 years, you know, since then. And, and so I really want to try to capture some of that optimism. The um, there are some memorable. I, 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 should, I should say. Let me just follow up on that. I wanted to capture some of that optimism because the plant itself in the book represents the future, and so I wanted to show that it. You know, it wasn't like this big company. You know, coming in and stomping on this little town. It was really was hope that that this would usher in this new era of prosperity. So, sorry. Well, that, then let me that. pick up on the 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 clean room. Because there's a scene where uh, Trace goes into the plant's clean room on a plant tour. And the way you described it, I almost felt, first of all, I felt like I was there. But second of all, I didn't feel like I was here there. I felt like I was on Mars there uh, or maybe even further out. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the, the clean room and, and how that contrasted as starkly as anything else with the land? Yeah, you know, that... that that chapter and then the chapters where Witherspoon goes to the ranch, that was really the beginnings of the book, was just the juxtaposition of those two things. And I started kind of playing around in my mind with how that might work. And, you know, if, you, if you've never been in a clean room, it really is kind of a weird experience. You go into like a locker room and you go through this whole process of putting on, you know, all this protective gear and, and you can't take, uh, you know, as a reporter, you can't take your notebook in. You have to have a special low fiber paper that they give you to take notes because it's all about keeping dust out of, uh, you know, any kind of small particles out of the air. And if you, you know, I, I have a beard and so you have to wear a special facial covering because they don't want any beard hairs floating out into the, the cleaner. And, and so you go through this process and, and you really, you kind of put on this bunny suit and it's, it's pretty intense. And, um, you know, and, and you do sort of start to feel claustrophobic. I mean, it's like, it's like w getting dressed for a really, really heavy winter storm, but then you know you're in this very antiseptic environment, and so you, you feel kind of like, kind of like the little brother from a Christmas story. You know, you're walking around, <laughs> all this stuff on, and and then yeah, you're in this. Uh, it, it, there is kind of a very science fictiony sort of feel to it. It's um, it's a very, very unusual experience, and and it, in my mind, you know, in writing the book. Um, the idea of putting a, a West Texas cowboy in that setting was just uh, just really a lot of fun. <laughs> it wasn't fun um, for him, but it was fun for me. <laughs> one of the underlying themes was that even when the book takes place in the <coughs> late 1990s, life or death on a ranch is literally a snap of a finger away. And we didn't have to experience death to understand that because we experienced that through Trace Malloy's son who wanted to go uh, into the Air Force and in the snap of a finger, he was pinned against a fence and shattered his leg and, and he couldn't make, meet the physical requirements anymore. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that, that sort of underlying life or death struggle that's, that's been about a part of a cowboy life since time immemorial. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to kind of capture that because, again, it, it points up the contrast. I remember growing up in Texas, um, you know, I, I grew up in College Station, and um, so you had, you know, a lot of professor kids and stuff, but then you also had kids that lived out in the country, and, you know, they just seemed to be so much older than the rest of us. <laughs> like, they were, they, they, they grew up faster, right? I mean, they had to learn to deal with a lot of things, and, and, you know, they went home after school, and they had to work on the ranch and, and work on the farm, and, 
you know, the rest of us were, you know, watching Gilligan's Island reruns or whatever. And so they, they just really, you know, th- those kids always seem to be older and know what to do in situations and that kind of thing. And I wanted to try to capture that, but I also remember reading an interview. Um, it may have been a Texas Monthly story, but it was, a, it was about a doctor in a small West Texas town or something who made the comment that the injuries you see uh, around ranching are – so severe that in a big city it might be considered, you know, child abuse or something. And and I really wanted to kind of capture that, you know, that um, not that I wanted, you know, Colt Malloy to have to go through this terrible accident, but um, but I really wanted to kind of show that, you know, his experience. And, of course, that also allowed me to explore the character of Dr. Lambeau a little bit more um, and, and kind of because she is kind of the, the go-between, right, between – between Trace Malloy and Blaine Witherspoon. She's been around long enough that she started to understand this stuff, but she didn't always. And so she's able to kind of help guide Witherspoon uh, to to come to understand the town a little better because she herself was an outsider once, right? Um, And so the accident with Colt sort of helped set up that whole whole situation. But, but yeah, that's kind of where it came from. I mean, it, it is true that, you know, Ranching can be very dangerous, and uh, you know animals can be unpredictable, and and uh, so you know if you if you grow up with that, you're just kind of you know there's a lot more broken bones and stuff than uh, than a lot of us probably experienced uh, growing up in the city. Um, Dr. Lambeau, I wanted to to explore her. She's one of the great secondary characters in this book, but when I read her, I saw her as the Greek chorus. <laughs> because she explained to the other characters what they needed to do, overlaid with that role I saw that I saw her having was a discussion of the practice of medicine in a small town, the challenges a doctor face, but also the passion that some doctors have for practicing that type of medicine and really committed to their Hippocratic oath and uh, will you know, take a bag of flour and payment if, if you can't pay to set a broken bone. And that, that still exists. And I thought that was an important story to tell as well. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed her character because it, it gave me a chance to bring kind of a different aspect of the outside world into, you know, the big empty. Uh, she's there for completely different reasons. She's not from there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I, like you said, I mean, I guess, yeah, she does fill that role with the Greek chorus. She was definitely the explainer for sort of both sides. She's kind, she is kind of the voice of reason in, in every situation. And um, I, I actually, when I, when I realized that I needed that character and I started to develop that character, I did a bunch of research on rural medicine and, and you know, a lot of the things you talked about, yeah, it comes out right away. I mean, it's a passion that people have um, that, that go into that field. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of capture that in her character. And uh, she's another one that, you know, kind of came there, thought she might stay for a few years and go on. And then, and then you know, the place starts kind of speaking to her and she, she doesn't want to leave. Uh, Lauren, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this recording, but uh, can you give us a hint if we've got uh, any more fiction coming out from uh, you, Lauren Steffi or your press? <laughs> well, I, I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, I, I am actually working on a sequel to The Big Empty right now. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I've really found that I enjoy doing fiction uh, a lot more than I thought I would, quite frankly. So, uh, I do think I'll be writing more in the future. Um, as for my publishing company, uh, we've got another novel coming out uh, here at later, uh, probably in the next couple of months. Um, but it's not written by me, and it's a it's a pirate romance novel, so uh, it's a very different thing. <laughs> well, we're going to link to uh, the book in the show notes. But tell us uh, if listeners wanted to know where to go to find the book, what would be the best place? Uh, so the book is called The Big Empty. You can find it uh, at stonycreekpublishing.com. Uh, you can also find it uh, on the website for Texas A&M University Press, Amazon, pretty much anywhere else you want to buy books. Lauren, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to visit with me. Uh, it was a great read, and this podcast has been a ton of fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hill Country Podcast. The Hill Country Podcast was recently awarded two separate podcast awards by the Communicator of America series, 
So I hope you'll check out some of the other podcasts on the Hill Country Podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Megaphone, the Compliance Podcast Network, or wherever great podcasts are found.